Welcome to the Church of Rock Show, Episode 6, King Crimson in the Court of the Crimson King. Sponsoring this episode is Nobody. If you have a product or service that you would like to advertise on the show, please contact us by either going to the website, thechurchofrockshow.com, and using the Contact Us section of the page, or you can send us an email at churchofrockshow at gmail.com, and we will see if we have a mutual fit. You can support the show by telling the music fan in your life about the show. Word of mouth goes a long way and would be greatly appreciated. If you like what you hear, consider leaving us a five-star review for the show on Apple Podcasts. We want to get this content out to as many people as possible, and those reviews go a long way with getting the show to the top of the directories. Also hit the subscribe button to wherever you listen to your podcast to be sure that you never miss an episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode six of the Church of Rock show. First of all, I just want to apologize it's raining here in my neck of the woods, and I tend to be picking up some of that environment from outside into my bedroom studio here as I record the episode. So if you hear a little pitter-patter, pitter-patter from some water outside falling down from my roof and going down the gutters, I apologize in advance again, and hopefully it won't bother you too much because we have a really good episode today. Today's episode, I'm going to be talking about King Crimson's debut album in the Court of the Crimson King. I'm not going to make a habit going too deep into a history of bands that I profile here on the podcast, but King Crimson is one of those exceptions because this band was and is always evolving with its personnel. The forever constant of the band is Crimson founding member, guitarist, keyboardist, and songwriter Robert Fripp. Fripp is not a lead man by any stretch, nor does he want to be classified as such. Fripp has said his role within King Crimson is that of quality control or a kind of glue. I find this very fascinating because I would see King Crimson as a leaderless outfit with no direction, but this isn't the case. Fripp undoubtedly is the leader of this band, or business, or franchise, or whatever you want to label this. The personnel is driven by Fripp and his ideas. The personnel for the debut album would only be in existence for this particular album, and would disband by the end of 1969, less than one year after its formation. King Crimson was formed from the ashes of the band Giles, Giles, and Fripp. From this band coming over to be what are considered the founding members besides Robert Fripp, our drummer Michael Giles, and multi-instrumentalist Ian McDonald. And to round out the band, we have Greg Lake on bass and vocals, and lyricist, light show and designer, and creative consultant Peter Sinfield. I want to talk about Greg Lake here for a minute. Greg Lake, as many of you know, is more famous for his role with the progressive rock band Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And that's where my first uh, exposure to Greg Lake was. And I was definitely familiar with his voice. He has a very, very distinctive voice and very powerful and something that, that is unique. So getting a little bit more into this album, to my surprise about hearing Greg Lake's vocals on the album... I was already familiar with the LP, and um, I, this album was a complete blind buy for me back in the early 2000s as I was getting into prog rock, and this album was a darling of the classic rock message boards and the prog rock message, message boards, and I just threw the CD on without even looking at the liner notes or looking at the personnel. I just went into this with no warning, which is how I approach my blind buys, and that's great. And just to kind of go back to, to the late 19. 90s and early 2000s where I was just really building up my music collection it was it was a lot more difficult to discover new music even discovered I would say for old music that's new to me because so much stuff ended up going out of print because you know it's just not selling well or it's not popular with the general public and these record companies are out there to make money but King Crimson's catalog was becoming more accessible on CD at this time so I just went ahead and went to the communities that I had most faith in when it came to discovering new music, and I just bought this album. And when I first heard it, I'm like, man, that's a familiar voice that's going through the speakers right now. And I was like, man, if I didn't know any better, the guy in this album sounds a lot like Greg Lake from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And then 
go ahead and I look in the liner notes and there he is, Greg Lake, lead vocalist at King Crimson in 1969 for the album In the Court of the Crimson King. Wow, so we have this newly formed band. It's early 1969, and they are rounding into shape. And they're ready to make their debut appearance live on April 9th, 1969 at the Rolling Stones free concert at Hyde Park. Pretty cool. They play on the same bill as the Rolling Stones in 1969, who, in my opinion, that's at the peak of their powers starting in 1969. And to be able to play with those guys at that time is a hell of an honor. But the even crazier part is the show attendance. Again, this is the debut of a brand new band. This, these, are, these are musicians that are young. They're not very well known. And they're being asked to play at this concert. Get ready for this. The attendance of the concert, 250,000 people. And that's on the low end. There are some estimates that there was a half a million people there at this concert. Young band, brand new band, new name. No one knows much about them making their debut in front of roughly half a million people. No pressure at all. <laughs> Talk about balls jumping into the middle of the ocean and being circled by sharks. The band survived. And now it was time to get into the studio and record the debut album, which commenced on June 1969. Please go to the show notes of the page for In the Court of the Crimson King on Church of Rock, churchofrockshow.com as I have included a video excerpt of a partial performance of 21st Century Schizoid Man from the Hyde Park show. It's really cool. Now on to the album. Initially, Tony Clark, who had, who had produced the Moody Blues during this time, was tasked to produce In the Court of the Crimson King. This turned out to be a failure. Robert Fripp stated, we realized we would make mistakes, but decided it was better to make our own mistakes. The band was given permission to produce the album themselves. Now, <clears throat> the comparison between the Moody Blues and King Crimson and why Clark was chosen to produce the album, I think had a lot to do with some of the progressive similarities between King Crimson and the Moody Blues. But... To me, that's where it kind of gets a little bit blurry because I don't really mix the Moody Blues and King Crimson too, too much. Uh, I see King Crimson, not only this album, but all their subsequent albums after, they're a really heavy band. Um, they can be chill in their way, but there's a heavy chill to King Crimson where the Moody Blues to me are very psychedelic and I and you can just tell by the lyrics of of their music they're knee deep in psychedelia there's a lot of references to doing psychedelics and going on psychedelic trips not all their music is like that but some of their best stuff does revolve around psychedelia and I don't really see King Crimson's music is falling into that psychedelic psychedelia realm so it could have just been one of those things where we had some record record executives uh, just looking at this from kind of like almost a narrow lens and saying, hey, we, these bands sound kind of like and we can kind of throw them together and let's get this producer in there since he's done a hell of a job with the Moody Blues. Maybe he can get something out of these kids, but it didn't act, it didn't actually work out. Um, and then also to... Um, with the Moody's, both, bland, both bands' music is complex, uh, especially as you compare it to the three-minute pop top 40 ear. The stuff is, it's almost a shock to the system because it doesn't sound like 1969 to me, uh, especially this album here in the Court of Crimson King. And you can even say the same thing about the Moody Blues. They're going on, a, on another realm altogether, but I think King Crimson is just going into another realm altogether. And they're just planting the seeds for other bands too. And I'm talking about King Crimson here. That would become prog rock staples like, yes, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and Genesis, just to name a few. And to see the direct correlation between, say, the Moody Blues in those particular bands, I'm not really hearing it too much. And the King Crimson dynamic, I can see that a little bit more. And then also, too, just to kind of put a wrap on, on the psychedelics and the psychedelia part, uh, Robert Fripp never has taken drugs. 
Uh, though this album is considered, in air quote, a drug album, uh, Fripp even stated that So I Was Told in the Court of the Crimson King was New York's acid album of 1970. Pretty interesting. See, people can find their own trips with certain kinds of music, and it wasn't necessarily the intention of the artist, but I would say if there's an audience for the album that may not been kind of like the direct intention of the artist that does happen and it's okay um as i mentioned um earlier in the show this incarnation of king crimson was short-lived by 1969 the first king crimson lineup was no more as ian mcdonald informed robert fripp that himself and michael giles were leaving the band they would go on uh, to record a great album in their own right under the group name McDonald and Giles, with that album being self-titled. If you're a for if you're a fan of uh, the of Court and of prog music in general, please take the time to check that album out, as it's not on Spotify and album music, Apple Music, not al- album music. <laughs> Craig Lake went uh, in his own direction too, as mentioned earlier, going into uh, forming the band Emerson Lake and Palmer, uh, Robert Fripp on the split of King Crimson. I returned to England with a broken heart. At the time, I couldn't understand how anyone could leave a group that, or with that originality and power. 27 years later, I know it's better to take a holiday after an overlong, grueling tour than a life decision which affects everybody. But these were young musicians and young managers. And I can kind of see where McDonald and Giles are coming from on this one because going into a project like anything, whether it's a band, a podcast, a television show, a movie, you go in there at the very ground level. There's, there are times when, when people do have the, the, the golden ticket and get to the top very quick. But King Crimson was not one of those outfits. They, they were from the ground up. These were a bunch of unknown guys that had very little experience and, Everything just became such a whirlwind for for these guys right off the jump. I mean, they're starting out in England and okay, they they play Hyde Park, which was pretty crazy, but then they're playing clubs, they're doing their thing recording this album, and then all of a sudden they're going off to the United States to promote the album and doing shows. Probably something that may not have been on the radar of McDonald and Giles at the time, but for Fripp it seemed like this is what he wanted and this is what the band's destiny was because he just felt that the band was just so great and he wasn't really surprised by the success that they had and he had goals obviously when it came to King Crimson and he was realizing the goals as going to be a worldwide act where McDonald and Giles once they got into the middle of all of it they're just kind of like tapping out at that point right like this is not for us. We can't be doing this anymore. This is becoming a too much of a strain. We're missing our home life and we need to get out of this. And yeah, I would, I do agree where Robert Fripp is coming from on this one, that maybe a decision like that shouldn't have been made in such an impulsive manner by McDonald and Giles, but just saying like, I mean, they had just quit, right? Right in, right in the United States, when they were out touring in California, they had told Fripp that they had had enough at, at that point. And they were going back home, and, and that was going to be it. And for Fripp, I mean, this is King Crimson's his baby. He probably he could have thought at that point, like, man, this, this might just be all coming to an end at this point. But thankfully for all of us, and for him, most importantly, that he's a pretty visionary type of guy, and, and he's tailoring his music that he creates and bringing in the musicians uh how how they fit best into the outfit so yeah it's pretty pretty interesting but just to again back into the album uh in the core of the crimson crimson king was released on october 10th 1969 roughly six months after the band's first public performance at hyde park the album was well received by the record buying public as it reached number 28 on the U.S. Billboard album charts and reached number five on the U.K. album charts. I was quite surprised by the fairly steep chart position this album achieved in the United States as this is one of those under-the-radar type of albums to many, um, but it did very well. 
Uh, I was expecting a narrative like the one episode, like the episode one of the Church of Rock show where I discussed the Velvet Underground and Nico and did not, and that album did not sell well. But as time went on, the influence of the album and the love would eventually come. But I'm not surprised that from the success of the album had in their native UK. I, I think that when it comes to music, the, the UK is definitely ready for something new and something fresh. Whereas United States airplay, when it comes to the radio or even what's being put on TV, a little bit more conservative than they are over in Europe. So to find out that this album peaked at, at number 28, I found was just, a, it was a stunning revelation. I was thinking that this album, before I did the research, would have been in the hundreds somewhere. I figured it probably did sell pretty good, but not as good as it did. Um, but the reviews for the album were mixed back in 1969. And this is not a shock to me, simply for it because in the Court of the Crimson King, as I mentioned before, and this is something, that, a narrative that I'm going to come up with as I go along, was a shock to the system, especially in 1969. Uh, here are some excerpts from John Morthland's review of In the Court of the Crimson King in Rolling Stone magazine from 1969. There are certain problems to be encountered by any band that is consciously avant-garde. In attempting to sound far out, the musicians inevitably impose on themselves restrictions as real as if they were trying to stay in a top 40 groove. There's usually a tendency to regard weirdness as an end in itself. And, and excesses uh, often ruin good ideas. Happily, King Crimson avoids these obstacles most of the time. Their debut album drags in places, but for the most part, they have managed to effectively convey their own vision of Desolation Row. And the more I listen, the more things fall into place and the better it gets. Um, here's, here's a word that, that came up in this review that I found to be quite interesting as it tends to be a word that I come across an awful lot from individuals who may not get progressive rock or even like progressive rock, and that's excess. Um, yeah, progressive rock can be can be a marathon at times, and some of the songs, yeah, they they do they do go on. Um, are they excessive or self indulgent? I think you have to take that on a case by case basis. I don't think that um, that's a fair label to put on any type of music. Sure, there is music where artists will say, you know what, I'm doing this for myself. I don't really care if the thing sells. I have this vision. I have this art that I need to get out, and I'm going to get it out. So to find that that word was used about what, what many consider and what I consider is kind of the foundation of progressive rock was quite interesting and almost kind of like that re you can look back at that at Morthland's review here and just say, well, this thing's kind of setting the scene of the culture of progressive rock. Uh, the, the set was an ambitious project, to say the least. Uh, King Crimson will probably be condemned for some pompousness, but that criticism isn't really valid. They have combined aspects of many musical forms to create a surreal work of force and originality. Besides which, they're good musicians. And by the way, this is still coming from Morthland's review on the Court of the Crimson King. Besides which, they're good musicians. Guitarist Robert Fripp and Ian McDonald on Reed's Woodwinds, Vibes, Keyboards, and Mellotron both handle rock, jazz, or classical with equal ease. Bassist Greg, Lakes, Greg Lake and drummer Michael Giles can provide the beat, fill in the holes, or play freeform. While Dylan and Lennon are still safe, Lyricist Peter Sinfield does show a gift, macabre as it may be, for a free association imaginary. How effectively the music can still be on stage is admittedly a big question. The answer is probably not too well. Still, King Crimson's first album is successful. Hopefully, there's more to come. And finally, Robert Criscow of The Village Voice was not as kind with his brief review, which he gave the album a grade of a D+. The plus is because Peter Townsend likes it. This can also be said of The Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Beware the forthcoming hype. This is 
ersatz shit. <laughs> Chris Gow does not mince words when he does not like something, but that's his opinion. And it's pretty cool to look back and see what someone's thoughts were. Who was there back in 1969? So we're just going to leave it at that. That is the brief history of In the Court of the Crimson King. Now let's jump into the tracks. that the atmospheric wind type of sound that, that, that you hear. And then all of a sudden it's just this explosion of heaviness that, that comes in with the, the band just rocking in there with Fripp's heavy guitar and in Lake and Giles just providing the backbeat. It's just absolutely tremendous. What we have here is a seven minute song, but very few lyrics to it, but damn, they're powerful. Cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeons scream for more at paranoia's poison door, 21st century schizoid man. To me, this is just some kind of random stuff here, but it makes sense for somebody who is stuck in their head, and it's just a lot of random thoughts, and it's just so real for so many people. Then it gets into blood rack, barbed wire, politicians, funeral pyre, innocents raped, with Napalm Fire, 21st Century Schizoid Man. To me, this passage is focused on a topic which, which is war and the war machine. This is a sign of the time. The Vietnam War is very much on the world's conscious. Especially powerful scenes are being shown worldwide in a very real way in the USA with a heavy troop involvement and in the conflict. There's no flower power and peace being mentioned here. It's a message that we tried that, and don't get me wrong, I love the peace movement, but there are times when you just have to get real, and, and Crimson is getting real here with this passage. Shit's going down. It's known on the down low in many ways, and everything is not what it's being portrayed on TV or in print. In a sad way, it's almost a bit of a foreshadowing of another thing that was kept down on the down low or even from a place of shame by those who suffer from PTSD or mental illness uh, as a direct uh, result of war. 21st century schizoid man. It took, us for, it took us to get to the 21st century to acknowledge the suffering is real from those who have witnessed the hells of war firsthand. I know it's a job for the troops, but it doesn't discount what it is they're feeling and what their views are. And the lyrics wrap up with death seed, blind man's greed, poets starving, children bleed. Nothing he's got, he really needs 21st century schizoid man. This is more of a generality of suffering um, in feeling the emotion and of all this here, seeing death seed, blind, blind man's greed. See, again, that's another direct correlation to war. Uh, war results in death, unfortunately, and many times war is the product of greed. There's something that needs to be fought for, and it may not even be an ideal. It could be a natural resource that's at stake or uh, a strategic piece of land to get business moving is at stake. And... It's just a reality of what war does bring. And with poets starving, children bleed. These are innocent people that get caught up in the middle of war. And it's just a shame that there's innocent people that get caught in the crossfires. It isn't, it isn't like war is 
played on on a game board where you just throw troops in the middle of somewhere and say, okay, guys, go at it and have it. Uh, war ends up in cities. It ends up in villages. It ends up in small towns. And unfortunately, innocents do get caught up in all of this. And in the end, nothing he's got, he really needs 21st century schizoid man. And that just comes back to when you talk about the scale of war, the reasons for war, is there really the fighting for something that somebody truly needs? Uh, just to kind of wrap this up here, the song is heavy in so many ways. The, the beginning 30 seconds or so are just so peaceful and ambient. But you get the feel, especially when you're familiar with the song, that shit's about to explode. Then Lake just belts into those lyrics. And the distortion is so fitting because when one thinks of mental illness or distress, whether it be one who is suffering or those who have loved ones who are suffering, when things flare up, clarity goes away. So th the distortion's perfect. The guitar hard strumming distorted and heavy are like punches connecting to the right side of your jaw. You know they're coming, but there's nothing you can do to stop it. And I feel it adds emphasis to the lyrics. The middle instrumental part, again, is very structured, but sounds frantic, and the bass is everywhere. The guitar riffing on top is just so damn heavy, and the drums are heavy and fast, adding by the, the horns of, of McDonald is almost a bit of a cheerful kind, like, like a high, then music, the music slows down a bit and gets softer and builds back up, and you can definitely hear the avant-garde jazz influence that Crimson has on this track. The next track is I Talk to the Wind. Why wouldn't this start song? Why wouldn't the song start with a wind passage? McDonald on the flute. It sets the scene for this track. It's the total opposite of 21st century schizoid man. Before jumping into the lyrics, I bet there are many of you who are listening to this podcast who feel at times of not being part of the mainstream and hell, you don't want to be, and you don't want to either or oftentimes have dreams or visions of living in a more of a free way, but it's hard to do, right? We have to put food on our tables, roofs over our heads, money to purchase great music, etc. The mood of the dreamy vibe, the music is so perfect. Imagine I talk to the wind set to the music of 21st century schizoid man. It would be depressing. I talk to the wind is very matter of fact. The wind instruments, the jazzy drumming, the bass chiming in, the guitar more of an accompaniment rather than being in the lead. And I compliment Fripp here for... Uh, here and how prog music is often at times described as self-indulgent indulgent or excessive for the writers and the arrangers. This is anti-prog in so many ways. And I want to just jump and read these lyrics here. They're just so damn beautiful. Said the straight man to the late man, where have you been? Right there. What are we talking about here? The straight man. This is, this is the, the professional. This is the guy who does everything by the book. This is the guy who has has responsibilities and and takes on his responsibilities. And then you have the late man who's just kind of like the guy who's like, oh, I live in kind of a timeless type of way. I'll get there when I get there. So you kind of have that you have that that conflict right there between two individuals who have two completely different uh, views as to how they live their lives. And then it goes into I've been here and I've been there. And I've been in between. To me, that's the late man talking to the straight man. Just kind of like, you know, it's almost like, but, but the lyrics say this is the straight man to the late man. Um, he says, where have you been? And then he just, the late man just goes, oh, I've, you know, I've been here and there. I've just been kind of floating around and seeing different things and going different places. And, you know, that's why you haven't seen me around too much. I talk to the wind. My words are all carried away. I talk to the wind. The wind does not hear. The wind cannot hear. See, this is the someone just talking to themselves and just sitting out in nature and with their thoughts. And the only thing that you have out there is you and nature. And if the wind's blowing, the wind's not going to hear you. So yeah, but it's it's all beautiful. It's all it's all real. I'm on the outside, looking inside. What do I see? Much confusion, dissolution, all around me. Again, I would say that this is more like the late man talking here. The late man is more internal and is more observant as to what's going on around him. I think he is a less sheltered type of person than the straight man because the straight man kind of almost lives in a bubble 
and he can't really understand what the late man is talking about here. Like, what are you talking about? Life is good. I've got everything I need. I'm comfortable. But he doesn't see the suffering that's going on in the world. And then it goes on and I talk to the wind. You don't possess me. Don't impress me. Just upset my mind. Can't instruct me or conduct me. Just use up my time. Again, this is a this is the, the free thinking person right here. The free thinking person is an individual. The free thinking person doesn't necessarily identify with being um, with a group of people or using other things that like labels that can be used to identify him in any way. Cause I know like there's something that when you get into a conversation with people, something comes up like, well, okay, where do you work? What do you do? And this guy doesn't really seem to care. He's like, well, I'm who I am here. No one owns me. Um, I don't belong to any group. So that's that. And then to wrap up the lyrics here, said the straight man to the late man, where have you been? I've been here. I've been there. And I've been in between. Puts a wrap to, to everything in there just so beautifully there. Here is what I call a Mellotron, Mellotron track. The Mellotron is, a prim, is the primary sound on this track, in my opinion. And I describe it as a grounding aspect to the song because everything else about the song for a great portion of it is built on top of the sound of the Mellotron. The Tron is not crazy sounding or big sounding like it can be. It's almost treated like a backing vocal in many ways. And it's very melodic and sweet. Not distracting in any way, but in the middle of the track, just before the four minute mark, there's a big Tron part where it does sound very big which is perfect because the Tron will then go away for a bit. And then there is a, is a series of big drums and beautiful winds. Then it goes right back into the first series of lyrics and jumping into the chorus, which is nothing short of emotional, which I get into a moment, but kind of closing up the music part of the track again, it just builds to this grand exit, which is highlighted by the Mellotron. After giving epi Epitaph, constant listens while preparing for the podcast i feel this is one of the best highlights of what the mellotron can do um you can get a little of everything you can get uh, the foundational subtlety of of the instrument and then you can have the large dramatic uh, music that the tron can produce now let's take a look at the lyrics the wall on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. When every man is torn apart, when nightmares and with dreams, will no, no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams. Between the iron gates of fate, the seeds of time were sown and watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. Knowledge is a deadly friend. When no one sets the rules, the fate of all mankind, I can see, is in the hands of fools. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh, but I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. To me, this is an apocalyptic scene of society being torn apart, and it's pretty conflicting stuff. Um... So just going back to the beginning of it here, you, they do talk about death. And there's this part where, this said, where it says that the sunlight brightly gleams uh, when every man is torn apart with nightmares and with dreams. See, this is kind of showing here that tragedy can happen in a blink of an eye. Many times it's not planned. Many times we are blindsided by it. It can be the most beautiful day that anyone's ever seen before, but tragedy strikes anywhere. And like, like, I mean, I hate to kind of go back to this, but I mean, I live in the Northeast part of the United States and I've had many trips to New York city. And when I think of something like that, I think about the day that nine 11 happened. It was such a peaceful day that day. Um, the, it was just a beautiful fall day. There's the sun was out. Everything seemed normal. And then all of a sudden this tragedy just happened. Just, 
attack happened. And I can almost kind of tie 9-11 back to what King Crimson's saying here um, about, okay, we have, we have a bright sunny day, but a nightmare is about to happen. And, and unfortunately, that day was a nightmare for many people. Uh, even going now into the, the second verse here, they talk about the norms and laws which were given to society and the right direction, but that can all be ruined by infighting and society fracturing, war, corrupt leadership, etc. Here, like between the iron gates of fate, the seeds of time were sown and watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. And then again, just to kind of wrap this thing up here, the fate of all my, mankind I see is in the hands of fools. Um, this is King Crimson just basically saying, hey, we have these laws that were created by people who may not necessarily be in tune with the constituents that they represent, which ends up being a conflict. But I think when it comes to laws and, and everything, they're great to have. We need to have them. But you also kind of have to have this moral code that you that you live by. And unfortunately, no one can tell you how to live that uh, or even tell you to live that uh, everything's a choice and getting more into the lyrics here it says between the iron gates of fate again that's the same thing there it's going back into you know talking about the fate of mankind into the hands of fools and then uh, the chorus is sung in first person um, as he is confused by what he is observing and how he is living and how he will ultimately die feeling this way and he will never know the truth. He does hold out hope that all will work out in the end. And this is, I can just hear just Greg Lake. It just sounds very emotional. He sings this. He goes, if we make it, we can all sit back and laugh. But I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. Uh, yeah, he is reserved to the fact that the end is going to be tragic. And it's not so terrible of a disappointment in repeating of the lines adds emphasis to what he feels will be the end result. When you, again, it's, you see, if you're not directly involved in a tragic situation, you, you have a different perspective on it from those people who are directly affected. And, and really those are the, those are the folks that, that we really need to show love and, and to show empathy for. Uh, again, with great, with Greg Lake here, he's just very pessimistic as what's going on around him because he's just saying, I, I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. And it's kind of a, a depressing way of, of going about living. But unfortunately some people have to go through that. It's, it's a sad thing. The next track is moon child. And I just want to read the lyrics here first, call her moon child dancing in the shallows of a river, lonely moon child dreaming in the shadow of a willow talking to the trees of the cobweb strange sleeping on the steps of a fountain weaving silver wands to the night bird song waiting for the sun on the mountain she's a moon child gathering the flowers in the garden lovely moon child drifting on the echoes of the hours sailing on the wind in a milk white gown dropping circle stones on a sundial playing hide and seek with the ghosts of dawn, waiting for a smile from the sun child. Listen to this track with headphones. This is the way to do it. The alternating symbols in the mix are so prominent and in many ways primary, even if that wasn't the intention and the calm guitar rhythm makes this so damn chill. And then add in some guitar screech at the end for some drama along with some subtle metal Mellotron pretty simple formula to go along with the dreamy lyrics for the first two and a half minutes of the track. Then the song goes into a free form improvisation by Crimson for nearly seven minutes to round out the song out the best way I can describe this as ambient and chill. But then you have probably other people's that would probably think that it's excessive and self-indulgent, but I don't have much to say about this track, uh, except that it's simple ambiance is there and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think with everything else that is going on with the album, it fits for what comes next, which is the final track, The Court of the Crimson King. 
Moonchild is the fitting prelude when you apply it to the context of the album rather as an individual track. Now, the final track, The Court of the Crimson King. This is the most, quote, proggy song, lyrically, of the bunch. And if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty of it all, this can be the point where prog begins. And let's read these lyrics. They pretty much are left to your own interpretation. The rusted chains of prison moons are shattered by the sun. I walk a road horizons change. The tournament's begun. The purple piper plays his tune. The choir softly sing three lullabies in the ancient tongue for the court of the Crimson King. The keeper of the city keys puts shutters on the dreams. I wait outside the pilgrim's door with insufficient schemes. The black queen chants the funeral march. The cracked brass bells will ring to summon back the fire witch to the court of the Crimson King. The gardener plants an evergreen, whilst trampling on a flower. I chase the wind of prism ship to taste the sweet and sour. The pattern juggler lifts his hands. The orchestra begin as slowly turns the grinding wheel in the court of the Crimson King. On soft gray mornings, when widows cry, the wise men share a joke. I run to grasp divining signs to satisfy the hoax. The yellow jester does not play, but gently pulls the strings and smiles as the puppets dance in the court of the Crimson King. Again, this is one of those one of those uh, you know bunch of lyrics here that that set you back into a moment in time, and I don't like like the themes involved with the court of the crimson king wasn't something that was really um explored by artists in 1969 this becomes more of a of a common theme especially in prog music getting into the 70s and you can definitely see the influence that this record had on other progressive rock acts and especially this song too um, I would say that the rest of the music that is on in the Court of the Crimson King kind of stands alone to the album and to King Crimson, but the final track, the Court of the Crimson King, is almost kind of like the gift that King Crimson gives to other artists and says, okay, everybody, this is the final act of this album and the final act of this particular incarnation of King Crimson. Now you can take this and run with it and go with it where you may. So it's a it's a definitely a fitting way to close out the album and to close out the lyric section of In the Court of the Crimson King. Now onto my story of the album. I'm going to set the scene first from a view by Robert Fripp. The group was immensely popular and immensely unpopular. Like it or not, the group is special. Why? What made the group so special? King Crimson in 1969 had the right music, musicians, music industry, and audience in attendance to make it work. These are some of the main factors which made King Crimson stand out and contributed to it, its success. Material, t executive talent, concept, commitment, energy of desperation, surprise, management, record company, publicity, media, album and album cover, the time of the world, technology, the Ford Transit van, Angus Hunking, and our good fairy. Wow. Robert Fripp just, he kind of, he does have the pulse of what is going on here. And he is in tune with the greatness of this album. Does not lie solely with him or the band itself, or the material. There's all these other factors that are going on around, not just around the band, but around the world in general, that I, I would say that maybe the world may not have been ready for this album in 1969, but I think it was something that needed to be made, especially at this time. When you look at the release of the album, it's the end of 1969. We're kind of winding things down when you talk about an era of music, in my opinion, when you're 
talking about like like mainstream psychedelia we're kind of getting more into the flower power type of you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna love one another um smile on your brother type of thing which is great stuff and but i mean there's artists are are getting into the truths of what's going on here and again artists like the beatles and the rolling stones they're the ones that are leading the charge there and, and there's just a, a lot of politically charged music going on here and in the core of the crimson king yeah it's uh, some of the lyrics are very politically charged but there's a different backdrop to how the content is being presented and king crimson does this in a very unique way and going back to when i first heard this album and i spoke about this a bit earlier in the podcast um i this was again a total blind buy by me uh, this was going back to when I'm perusing a lot of the rock and progressive, progressive rock message boards, and this album would come up quite often saying like, hey, this thing's really great. And then on top of it, you have this album art too. It's just absolutely fan fantastic. It's You see this big face taking up the whole album. It's very colorful. He's looking off to the side, almost kind of giving like that stink eye kind of look. And the ears are just like, like there's like this big wall of noise that's coming at the face and it's just wrinkling up his face. And there's just a lot of distress going on with the look of the man on the album cover. And in many ways, this is, is kind of a representation of what the music is on the album itself. And, to, it's almost like it kind of fits in so many ways. And to this day in the core of the Crimson King is one of my, my favorite album covers. And damn, if, if I can, if I ever had a, a nice size print of that thing, and I know Robert Fripp is the one that has, <laughs> has the original and he's not letting go of that thing anytime soon. And to be, to face it, if that the original prints of the art for in the court of Crimson King ever came, uh, to pass needless to say i would not be able to afford them and um we'll just kind of leave it at that but um going back to when i first got this album i was i, I would say i, I consider myself a, a pretty good prog rock fan i'm becoming more versed in the genre even today um i'm still discovering new stuff um, especially I, I kind of hang around in the 1970s when it comes to, to my prog rock exposure. Um, I think it's kind of a, a natural progression for me, uh, going back to kind of the psychedelic sounds, even though we're talking about a band that's not in tuned to psychedelics themselves, but you can see kind of like the dotted line of psychedelic music to prog rock music, especially, um, even with King Crimson in sort of way, but, but I still see King Crimson as kind of, they're, they're more, they're more of an innovative type of band too. I don't really say like, like, Oh, King Crimson. You can't even say like King Crimson is influenced by fill in the blank band. I just don't see that. He's Robert Fripp in his vision is so unique. And the way that he approaches his art is like no other. And, that's what kind of attracts me to this band. And in the court of the Crimson King was the first King Crimson album that I purchased. I have gone on to purchase, I would say probably the rest of their seventies output. Uh, when those things came out and I do believe it was the 40th anniversary of King Crimson, where we had the Steven Wilson mixes uh, with the surround sound mix and the new stereo remixes but i did have a version of this album prior to the wilson remixes coming out in those wilson sets so i did have it but then this was kind of like the album that was the launching point to to more things when it came to king crimson and leading up to this point here i did have exposure to prog rock as i was I had albums from Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Genesis. And if you want to throw Pink Floyd into that mix, you can kind of go ahead with that too. I kind of don't like throwing Pink Floyd into the mix, but that's a discussion for another time. So I had this prog rock foundation 
And when it came to an argument that goes on, and this happens with all, I would say, newer type of genres outside of like, we're going to say, you know, rock or R&B or anything. Two of the, two of the genres that I come up with that there's always the argument of, okay, where the, where was this born? One of them is metal and the other one is progressive rock. And it's not surprising that in a modern sense, that metal and progressive rock go hand in hand. And in fact, we have this kind of new, newer type of genre called prog metal. So you can even say in some ways that King Crimson could be some, one of the fathers of prog metal as I find their music is just very heavy. And then even with in core of the Crimson King, just going into 21st century schizoid, man, that to me was just an absolute punch of the gut. When I first heard that, that opening sequence to that song, I literally just kind of like not to mince words. It was kind of like a Holy shit moment. Like to me, I was like, are you freaking kidding me? How did this music elude me for so long? Uh, how like to even think that like this went down in 1969 for the way that I was kind of like predisposed to music and what my vision of music was to me, this wasn't one of those things where I was like, man, this is 1969. Everybody, this, this is a new vision that's going on here. And it was more or less something that you can put this album as one of those statements is like, all right, the sixties are over. We need to start going into another direction because everything kind of runs its course. And I think that at the time, maybe in the mainstream, the, the peace and love movement for some people was becoming a little bit tired and they were looking for a new direction. And this is kind of one of those new directions that, that people were, were going towards. Um, so that's, what's always kind of fascinated by me. And the fact that for me, if I guess if I ever had to be dropped it, into another era of time, it probably, I probably would be one of those peace and love type of guys to, to be honest with you. Um, I would probably hang out there first and foremost, but then I'm a realist and I know that societies evolve, art evolves. And to me in the court of the Crimson King is an evolution of rock music. And to me, when going back to the argument, what was the first progressive rock album? And one of like, I hate when, when it comes up, like, like all oh, the Beatles are the, of the, the first progressive rock, uh, band, uh, you can see, rubber soul is the first progressive rock album. And like, I, I think that in a lot of ways that almost becomes a cop out is when something new and innovative comes down the line, it's always easy to say, Oh, it was the Beatles. The Beatles did it. I love the Beatles. They're my favorite band of all time, but I would not consider the Beatles progressive rock. And if there was, if I had to just throw a dart onto the dartboard and say, this is the one in the court of the Crimson King is the one for me. There's, this is where it all starts. This is where the game changed in so many ways. This is a point in time where I can say, all right, this is unique. This is groundbreaking type of stuff. And you can see the direct line of other albums as you go down the line. And you can even look at even progressive rock today and prog metal today. And even metal today can show a direct line to in the court of the Crimson King. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Church of Rock show. I appreciate you for sticking with me while I work out through each episode. Please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and Podbean, and on the show notes page on the website churchofrockshow.com. If there's another platform that you use, please share this with me, and I'll work with getting the show on there too. The audio version of the show is not now available on YouTube. At this time, do a search on The Church of Rock Show to find the page as the show has not reached its YouTube minimums to give the page a proper web address. So please like the page, watch the show on there, or better yet, listen to it because you're not seeing my face on there just yet. So we can get the numbers up so we can accomplish this and get that proper site name out there. Share the show with a friend. 
Word of mouth goes a long way to grow the show. Visit the show at churchofrockshow.com and check out the show notes underneath the podcast section of the site for bonus material such as videos, photos, and a direct links to listen to the albums on Spotify and Apple Music. Check us out on social media on Facebook and Instagram at Church of Rock Show. On Facebook, this is where the official show page is going to be for the community to interact with each other on each episode. So please go there as there is no comment section on the show notes page. Everything is going to go through Facebook. And on Instagram, I'm going to share you share with you different pictures of rock and just in general music history and to even share what I'm currently listening to today. And also we are on Twitter on Church of Rock 75. And special thanks to Hyde for providing the theme music for the Church of Rock show and check out and support his work at soundcloud.com forward slash David Hyde music. Until next time, I will catch you for another episode of the Church of Rock show.